Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Equine Touch Studio. And we've got a fantastic presentation for you this evening. Well, it's a chat, really, isn't it, Rachel and Hannah? Uh, we're going to be talking with Rachel and Hannah all about connection training and really what brought them to this point of um, presenting connection training to the to the world, really, from beginnings a long time ago, I seem to remember, Rachel. But we're going to come back to that. So we're just going to wait for a few more people to jump onto the line. So do let us know where you're watching us from. And uh, we will look forward to uh, having a chat with you later. So, Rachel, just to check that your comms are all right. We might have to check Hannah's as well. Rachel, <laughs> I think you check you're your fine, are we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Hannah, just check that your comms are all right, even though you're sitting in the uh, same same place. We're, yeah, unusually for us, we are actually in the same room this time. <laughs> and you're in and same you're country, at your home, Hannah, even. aren't you, in the Pyrenees? You're just telling me you've been skiing this after today. This morning, yeah. This morning, um, very jealous. Well, it was. We had to grab the sunshine because it's due to rain and snow a lot and get very windy. So, uh huh. Righty ho. Um, well, we've got a few people online, so <laughs> do let us know where you're joining from. And I just remind you, we're joined with uh, Rachel and Hannah here from Connection Training, and we're going to be chatting with them about where they started from ages ago, and that was through Equine Touch, wasn't it, Rachel? Isn't that what? Oh, what, well, what I think we kind of started things before we found Equine Touch, but uh, oh, we'll we can come yeah. to that. Yes, yeah. then let's start, very... start from the beginning. Wherever you want to start would be super. Start <laughs> well, I think uh, I think Equine Touch. When we discovered Equine Touch, it was um, phenomenally useful for the problems that we were having with Hannah's pony Toby. Um, but that was in two thousand and six, I think. I can remember our first equine touch weekend and we'd been having problems with to Toby for the eight years we'd owned him by then. <laughs> so... And Hannah, how old were well, you yeah. then? You were still a teenager, weren't you? Yes, yeah, so I was 11 when we got Toby. Um, wow. So we've had him 25 years next week. He's Ooh, still going wow. strong. And he's still going strong. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, he's a bit, he's slow and old, but he's hes going and he's living in Yorkshire. Um, so yeah, I was 11 when we got Toby. Um, is this Toby here? That is Toby, yes. Yeah. That was after we'd sorted out <laughs> a lot of the, the the problems. So yeah, he was the real catalyst for a lot mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, I'd, I'd been horse obsessed and lived at the riding school and eventually got a pony of her own, which brought uh, Rachel back into horses as an adult and then um yeah and then we started to have a lot of the kind of traditional behavior problems so he just didn't really want to do anything so he didn't really want oh. to be caught he was anxious about leaving his field uh buddy he didn't really want to be tacked up he didn't want to go in the horse box he used to bolt back mm. home um so yeah we started looking for, well you obviously drove it because I was too young at that stage yeah, to, to yeah. find but you were the one that started then looking for other ways of <laughs> doing things other solutions yeah. yeah but we were in the classic situation that I'm sure many people know where the, the you know the parents get the child a pony but the parents know nothing <laughs> <laughs> I had uh I had I was a horsey child in a non-horsey family uh -huh. um, and there wasn't enough money for riding lessons and all that sort of stuff. So I, um, but I had studied agriculture and I'd been a farm advisor and I'd married a farmer, um, although he wasn't farming by then. So the I think the kind of first things I began to look at was nutrition um, okay. and you know, sort of studied the digestive system and so on. Because um, when you took Toby to Pony Club camp just after we'd got him, um, he just was so loose. He was painting the walls and the stable and it was so yeah. difficult to keep him clean and all the rest of it. So I think the first thing I realized was, hmm, this doesn't seem to be right. Mm -hmm. And that began the journey. Um, but I'm a bit of an egghead. So as soon as there's a problem, I head for books and research and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and you're very much more of an active learner so you try different things and you get involved in different things so yeah. we're kind of a, a quite a good match in that way well I think to with Toby so then it took it into it was natural horsemanship training obviously as the next big thing Monty Roberts was very big at the time and then yeah Pirelli and then Australian natural horsemanship and then kind of just getting into groundwork and and playing and then you just started to bring in loads of people in from around the world and started organizing yeah 
clinics. Well, courses. I know when I first met you guys, when I heard about you guys was when um, I went on what I'm through Gillian Booth, really, from the clicker training. But there was this yeah. natural horse group, and I and I just moved. Well, I'd been all around the country, and I'd never heard about anything like that before. And I thought, you know, here we are supposed to be. You know, I mean, you guys are in Yorkshire, I'm in Northumberland, but I thought, you know, these things are supposed to happen down south, aren't they? But they don't. <laughs> it's the it's well, the area, outlying areas where we have to find our own solutions or look for different things. Because when I go down south, quite often it's still quite traditional with with the way people are looking at things. I might be being unfair there. So, so Rachel, I mean, that was just fantastic. You did the natural horse group, and I gather Leslie did the trimming, and you did well, equine match, didn't you? So you sort of had a few people getting involved. Well, we started. I started the natural horse group in two thousand and one, and I meant natural in the sense of according to nature, rather than natural in the sense of natural horsemanship. Yeah. Um, even though at that time we were kind of still doing natural horsemanship, but mm. it was a holistic, I nearly called it the holistic horse group. And then, but then everybody thought that's just about health, but yeah. it was about everything you needed to learn. And we'd gone barefoot as well in 2001. Um, and I had joined um, the equine behavior group and forum. forum and was really going, you know, getting, you know, uh, meeting people like Mark, Mark Kylie Worthington and Lucy Reese and, you know, people, really expert people. And I just thought, well, if I want to learn from these people, I'm going to have to run clinics and workshops and bring bring them to us. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Hannah was a teenager with her pony by then. And if I needed a demo rider or something, I mean, I used to bully you and I said, like, if you want to have your pony fed, you're going to ride at this clinic, girl. Yeah, there was a bit of pressure. <laughs> When it was, you know, I was a bit scared of these because you bringing a lot of the, the people came over from America yeah. or Australia. They're some really amazing top people. people. Yeah. Um, but, mm. you know, you're doing it in front of an audience. It was a bit daunting. But um, my yeah. pony madness was continuing, luckily. And it so. was on still with Toby. And you it were was doing all these things with Toby. Still with mm. Toby. Yeah. So um, so coming back to the Toby journey, then sorted out a lot of the bits about the kind of management the nutrition the lifestyle I mean saddles tack training mm -hmm. handling <laughs> um but the bit that where equine touch came in was that um he'd always had kind of weaknesses and and stiffnesses in uh in his stifle and in his poll and we were starting to really understand how much the uh physical um kind of problems can cause the behavioral problems and how they're really really linked um so yeah doing the equine touch well it was really pivotal for me because actually um I started a degree in something else completely <laughs> and left that because there weren't enough horses and came back in that um uh and then I trained in equine touch and decided that you know it was just so amazing and the results were incredible and it was we'd been using uh, different body workers um osteopaths and uh, bowen therapists and things for toby but um he really needed it regularly uh, at that mm. time and um yeah and i'd had my well we both had our own physical problems as well where we'd learned a lot so yeah i did the equine touch and vht and worked in that it was kind of my first job as well as working for rachel with the feed did those yes yeah, so i had a, a feed business by then i was the first person to distribute simple system feed over the country mm -hmm. because that again and i can't i think it jane van lennep i invited to the natural horse group uh mm -hmm. who started simple system feed and it, it was one of the directors um and um that really really sealed the deal for me about the horse's digestive system and what they needed to eat and everything mm -hmm. um and I started um, having to badger everybody I knew into joining me to get pallets sent up from Suffolk. So getting pallets set up, sent up that we shared out between friends mm -hmm. um, uh, then developed into me um, starting a business. So in 2004, I started a business selling uh, Simple System Feeds, which at that time was pretty well the only kind of pure feeds without added yeah. molasses and grains and additives and everything yeah. now there's a good range of that stuff but you couldn't get yeah. it in a tax store so I had my mm -hmm. delivery round so it worked really well because we began to realize that you know a lot of people needed their horses to be treated um mm -hmm. they had issues so Hannah became one of my came my van driver and feed deliverer and you'd and often and do equine touch uh, along the way along the route as well yeah all right 
Yeah, they, yeah. Hannah, I think it's interesting because, you know, for those of us who are a bit older, Hannah, Rachel and I, who we're a little bit older, you know, we sort of come to thinking about alternative things or different ways of doing things later in life. Um, and usually because of our own physical issues and everything. But but you were sort of in that situation a lot sooner. And and in a way, there was a point where I was a little bit envious of you, though I wasn't a little bit envious of all those situations. But it was the fact that you were so young coming to it, because I thought you can have, you can take on and you can fly with it. And it's fantastic because you have, whereas the rest of us are sort of quietening down our lives, really. So how's, how was that experience for you? Because Because did you ever think this is the direction you were going to go in? I mean... Did you have um, a, I mean, an astronaut or something, you know? No, I mean, since I was little, little, I always, well, I, when I was little, little, I wanted to be um, an event rider to ride horses all the time. And I was mad on eventing and uh, a vet to help horses and a teacher because yeah. I like teaching. So I've kind of pulled all those together in my to. career. <laughs> in a different <laughs> way. I feel like I'm helping them when I get to teach people. But um, so, no, I'd always kind of wanted to do that. There was a brief, time in during uh high school where I got really into um dance and um directing I kind of wanted to be a choreographer or a film director so that's oh, kind of I did that for a bit so but is then that where the came Kento up. videos come from <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> there are some great videos of pantos are they on your youtube channel though um oh, they're on our old youtube channel because uh oh. yeah they're a bit old now but um uh the ponytails so I did um I did Snow White a ponytail and Cinderella which was a 10 minute really daft but one of the most fun things I've ever done in my life um <laughs> uh retelling of traditional ponytails but with uh, traditional fairy tales but with ponies in so uh <laughs> yes we had Snow White and the seven ponies and the queen had her horse and the kid the prince had his horse and uh Huntsman had her horse and you know, the pumpkin Brilliant. carriage was pulled by copper and we have magical unicorns and yeah, just, just mad stuff. Yeah. So yeah, Brilliant. a lot of fun, but uh, that's uh fun So when did you start day. expanding your herd then, Rachel, getting in more rescue ones? Because did you not oh, think you well, had enough with Toby really? Suddenly you... Well, you know what horses are like, don't you? Horses come in herds and you think you get a pony for your child and then you realise, oh my God, this pony can't live on his own. Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately, um, there was another a girl in the village who became was one of your best friends uh, and they needed a place to keep their fell pony. So um, Janet joined us. And then when we bought Toby, Han Hannah's favourite pony at the riding school had been Little Poppy, who was 12 hands. Mm -hmm. And um, and and Hannah wanted, you know, when we said we would buy her a pony, she wanted to buy Poppy. And I said, well, no, she's too small and she's too old. Mm. But I had to promise that we would give Poppy a retirement home or Hannah wasn't going to let us buy her a pony. <laughs> <laughs> and so Poppy came to us. She retired from the riding school. And then um, my niece had ridden and knew this ex racehorse really, really well. And this her owner went off to Japan. Um, and so we ended up giving her a home. So, you know, you buy one pony and then you've suddenly got four and that's when they start to be happy that there's enough horses for them. <laughs> so we had four within a year, I think, of having Toby. We had four living with us. And wow. then it kind of came a bit more official because in 2004... We were both getting very into it. Was it 2004? It was a little bit earlier than that. We we started, I don't know if people know Abby Gail Hogg, who wrote the Horse Behaviour Handbook. Um, okay. um, but Abby had um, come to um, live on our farm in her caravan. She brought her pony. Um, yeah. And because we'd gone down the barefoot route together and she was also yeah. writing the Horse Behaviour Handbook. So we got involved with photographs and stories and doing some of the research and things. There's Toby's in there and, yeah. and Mel's is in there, the ex-race horse. Uh -huh. um, and um, she and I started the first little training company um, called Horse Centre Training. And okay. we ran some it was mainly on equine ethology and so on but we were way way before our time I think we're talking 2002 2003 or something yeah so we were yeah. way way before our time 
Um, but that's when we started, we rescue, we, people started to offer us horses who needed homes, you know, mm -hmm. because by this time we had 15 acres. And obviously if you've got 15 acres and you've only got four horses, you need more. Yeah. So that's what we started. We got Murphy and we got Khalil and Rasheen. And, Rasheen. and the plan was to rescue, rehab and rehome. Um, yeah. Khalil and Rasheen are still on the farm in Yorkshire and Murphy <laughs> Uh, died. died on the farm in, Yorkshire. On the farm in Yorkshire <laughs> when he was very old. So, yeah. so yeah, yeah not they... so good at the rehoming part. <laughs> <laughs> but you gave them another opportunity at having a, a, a nice life, which is a great thing to do. Very much yeah. so. But again, if you think about the Echo and Touch, all of them needed so much work physically. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they were all very distressed in their bodies. Mm. And um, and that was really significant when you started to really study the equine touch and be able to give them regular treatments. And yeah. um, well, I think those three, along with Toby, because Toby had, had this kind of stiffness and not lame, but just not quite mm. right. Uh -huh. um, and going off, you know, and just kind of leading to. Um, again, by this time, it wasn't big behavioural problems, but it was just kind of re reluctance and resistance. But these three, I mean, Rasheen was an absolutely knackered ex-show jumper who was terrified of everything. Really? Murphy was a poor little kid's pony who hadn't seen a dentist till he was 12, and he'd had a molar that never came in. So yeah. the other one had caused awful damage, and his back was a mess, and he was really, really, really aggressive. Um, and then mm -hmm. Khalil, who was an Arab who was born, well, it said he was born with a clubbed foot, but by the time he came to us, he was um, he had a, a very twisted leg, actually, oh, and wow. would stand with his right legs on the left side of his body and his left legs on the right side of his body. No, right. oh, poor thing. Um, yeah, so the three of them took us on a lot of... Um, Vast <laughs> amount of learning. <laughs> and that's, that's so really you, where so we... You're getting all the you. emotional things as well then, really. You're, you're getting all the... Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I was just looking up... Um, because traumatized came into my head and I, I just looked up the word traumatized because uh, it said subject to lasting shock as a result of a disturbing experience or physical injury. And if you think oh. about any horse that's ever been born here, a domesticated horse, it gets taken away from its mother, usually quite early. It gets shifted off somewhere. It may have a few more homes. It then gets started quite quickly. Sometimes people think it's it's got the looks, therefore they're going to push it. You know, they want to get a fast turnover to sell it. And then by the time we end up with them, they've gone through so much. And then they get rehomed to another home and another home. I just, it's just a terrible thing. I don't think people give enough thought to, to the experience for the horses. And you've obviously picked on, you know, the, the sort of ones that came to you really needed a lot of help in that direction. So, and that, how much did that inform? Were you aware at the time? That, you, that that was informing your learning Hannah did you in, are you empathetic I mean you obviously are empathetic but did you did you sense that with them you know when you were working with them did I sense how it was yeah that their emotions and how they were how they were feeling and you yeah, know they confused they were the ones. yeah yes definitely and actually uh, I mean Khalil the Arab he's we've got a picture of Khalil there he's um, the one oh, with the tarp with the tarp bottom Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. That was Khalil. That's he Khalil. actually wasn't too bad emotionally. Um, yeah. I think luckily because he'd been lame from from birth, pretty much people hadn't done very much with him. So it's just okay. he was just really, really underweight and nobody wanted him. But he was very he wasn't too bad. But the other two, Rasheen and um, Murphy. Murphy, had I mean, they were just terrified. And Murphy was so aggressive, wasn't he? But they um, they were the ones that really started to get us. Um, more and more and more into positive reinforcement yeah. into clicker training yeah um, was that with Alexander Kurland was that you were you yeah. were yeah. doing with her yeah I mean at the, at the time by then I was um teaching natural horsemanship um okay. to to various people and helping them get the horses loading and doing all that sort of stuff you were off doing equine touch and 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 things and um when Rasheen arrived in 2004, she was so scared and so out of her head mm -hmm. that I realized that everything I knew was no use to her at all. Okay. That I didn't have any tools in my toolbox that were going to help her because she was so scared. 
Mm -hmm. and yeah, so if you looked at her she would just freeze and yeah. if you continued to really? look at her she would start shaking and sweating yeah oh um, my goodness even from a distance and yeah. murphy would just i mean he, he, he would attack he would attack he just he just run at you a little he, welsh pony just you know in the yard or the field and then he'd rear mm. up on his back legs and and um, box and then he'd turn around and double barrel and he, he would head button bite as well he had a lot of problems he was fantastic he was the one in cinderella that ended up in the house cleaning the kitchen and was like cinderella's best <laughs> he was friend buttons. And... he was buttons in cinderella <laughs> yeah wiping the table and bringing her bin bags and all of the stuff but at first and it, with the with i'd never experienced i mean i was quite young still at the time but i never we never experienced a horse that just like came at you and mm. the more pressure you put on the just the more he did and yeah. I knew that he'd got into this state because of people just pushing him and hitting mm. him. And and I was like, well, the only way I feel I can stop it is to to do the same and it makes it worse and it's how he got here. So I don't want to do that. Yeah. So I don't know what to do. So yeah, we took him, we didn't, didn't take Rasheen, did we? we took Murphy to an Alex Curlin clinic. We did, we took Rasheen yeah, and Murphy. We took, oh. we took Rasheen and Murphy in 2006, I think. Because we've been doing clicker training a bit with them and with Toby and using the, a lot of the things together for a few years by then. But very little and very unskilled, mm -hmm. just learning it from books and ideas and things. Yeah. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we were uh -huh. trying it. Yeah. Um, but these two, yeah, they, they kind of challenged us a little bit further. They so were huge <laughs> it was like, challenge. okay, we need, we need to upskill here. Um, and and actually the skills that we learned um, from Alex and then also continuing over the next, the subsequent years um, with our own uh, learning and trial and error um, changed them beyond anything into mm. two very happy, uh, easy to handle, super duper horses. Um, and that was really kind of a big turning point for mm -hmm. both of us. Um, but that's when I got more into doing teaching positive reinforcement rather than doing the equine touch um, uh -huh. although I still did it with my own horses but it, that was yeah yeah. Of, as I yeah yeah ended and, up you, and you got involved a lot with, with James Shaw didn't you bringing him over Rachel and helping him to the Tai Chi so it was funny yeah. enough this all happened in 2006 we had our first equine touch with Lynn Palmer up our first equine mm -hmm. touch uh weekend we had our first weekend with Alex Curland um we had our the, a very big uh, conference we ran over a weekend on barefoot horse keeping and we brought Pete Ramey in from the States um, wow. and had loads of vets and so on their farriers and everybody there. And then we had our first James Shaw Tai Chi for equestrians clinic uh -huh. and it all happened in the space of about two months in 2006. Wow. It was like, wow, <laughs> you know, um, these things, you know, they'd been a bit all building it individually and coming to that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and of course, we were well into the feeds by that time. That and um, so, with it, with I think with the Tai Chi for riding, and I think you found this with the Equine Touch because when one of the reasons you wanted to do Equine Touch was because you didn't have to do people; you could learn okay. it. Unlike becoming an Equine Physio or something, you had to do yeah. people, and you didn't want to do people. And then you started doing their horses, and then realised that you come back the next month, and the horse would be the same again because the rider was crooked. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So then you started studying the VHT and doing the, yeah, the, did, the riders mm -hmm. as well. And that then, mm -hmm. and also thanks to some of the, the Tai Chi riding work we did with James, got yeah. really, really, really interested in the mm -hmm. uh, kind of biomechanics, the biomechanics, horse, yeah. horse and rider, yeah. which yeah. helped, um, yeah, make the, because the VHT then was for riders, it wasn't for people. So mm -hmm. it was <laughs> a slightly different <laughs> emphasis. <laughs> Well, I suppose then it's always good because you can sit, you can track whether there's any positive change going on for the for the pairing, isn't it? Really? Yeah, and it came about that. again building that relationship exactly between mm -hmm. the two, and that was yeah really rewarding and mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. effective. Yeah, and and then we um, as as that sort of grew and and developed, um, you had some clients that you were then doing you were treating them, treating their horse, giving them a lesson, delivering the feed, giving them a lesson, yeah. treating their horse and then finishing off by treating them yeah. and uh, started to do the whole round thing. And that yeah. I think was when you really began to understand that you needed to go into even more depth and you started studying Philippe Carl as well at that point, didn't you? Yeah, that was again, following more of the movie, getting more into kind of the classical dressage stuff mm -hmm. um, and understanding more about, um, 
how the movement supports the body and how yeah. um, we can really help horses be healthier and humans healthier and sounder through the exercises that we do with them um, mm -hmm. rather than you know it was it was such a good addition to the mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what I was doing already yeah and, yeah. Um, and I was thinking after we'd spoken earlier on that I don't know if you've seen the talk we had with Matthew you know Matthew Jackson I don't know if he, he came down to to any of the things that you guys did but he was yes. talking very much about you know that the horse that as youngsters they don't get a chance to develop or develop yeah, absolutely. the or anything because either yeah. they're on a flat field or they're you know they're not running about or they're not on different surfaces and things like that. so you end up trying to ride a horse that hasn't actually got the, the hoof development to support what's going on yeah. anyway let let alone the body development so so you're yeah. coming in to try and help that body development are you yeah yes and um it's amazing how much can change with some small with just a little bit of work and I think we found that through the ourselves through the Tai Chi stuff. yeah yeah um just understanding more about uh, you know good alignment and a few simple exercises can really yeah make a difference so well, I think um, the Tai Chi is great at showing you where you're weak isn't it because your balance if you can't stabilize yourself then you reckon it's a way of being able to find for yourself what's going on rather than just going off as a as somebody else helping you, you know. I think it's yeah, and I think that once you sit on the horse, the horse magnifies that. So mm -hmm. if you're, you know, most of us are weighted one side or the other, for example. So it, it helps explain why you, you know, you fall in in one going in one direction and you fall mm -hmm. out going in the other direction and you mm -hmm. learn how to um, get yourself balanced and you learn how to get that kind of feedback from your body. So, you know, it, it, um, it's very much about body awareness and then uh, the corrections are very, um, uh, what's, I don't know what the word would be. They're very um, subtle because there's yes. a lot to do with your breath and because the horse magnifies it so much, you yeah. can change a lot um, with, with thinking about your breath and your focus. Um, so it's, it's a very subtle um, way of, of riding. Um, many, many good teachers teach the same thing but that's under mm. a different label or no yeah. label at all it's just how they teach and yeah. um, you know a really good trainer who will watch you walk down the center line um and you know uh no help you note that the horse is kind of going off the center to the left mm. they'll help you correct that by uh helping you become more aware how do you get that right sit bone more mm. plugged in moving with the horse how do you just mm. change that um and so that was what we really learned there wasn't well I think it? also coming back to the kind of healthy movement thing is that when we started the Tai Chi we were both in really bad shape yes, we were. <laughs> so Rachel had come off Toby um just in a freak spook accident and broken her back a couple of years before oh and I tried from I'd done them um, uh, going back to the uh, quite a lot of really intensive um contemporary dance training as a teenager which oh, is, that okay. also possibly combined I fell off as well and broke my coccyx and I don't think that helped but um right. uh yeah but we both had quite a lot of pain generally right. just daily in daily life and a lot of uh, a lot of problems you in your back and me and my hips and pelvis mm -hmm. um and although we were doing a lot of a lot of the right stuff that deep diving with James because Rachel started organizing his UK clinic so we were working with him three times a year for several years but like like deep dive into like your own body awareness and your own alignment um again just took it a level deeper which then kind of really helped to influence the the training of them the how we're exercises that we can kind of help the horses do the same yeah um, I suppose it's not the about thing isn't it that it that you have to embody these things in a way? It's not something you can do and then yeah. go away and ignore it for two months and then come back and do it. I mean, that's the whole point is to try and create a new habit for you as a person, but also try and do something for the horse. So even if, you know, when you're working with horses, you could even just do five minutes a day and that's going to be something than doing nothing, yeah. you know. And we're very, with in-connection training, we're very, we, we have a lot of work on the ground. I mean, we're very much, we love riding. Riding's our goal and, you know, that's uh, very much part of it. Um, but in order to have that horse that 
is comfortable to be ridden and is joyful to be ridden and comes up voluntarily to the mounting block and says, yep, please get on, this will be fun. Mm -hmm. And we do an awful lot of work on the ground. And, and like you were talking about with the young horses, um, yeah, that, that's in an arena, but with the young horses, the, them not getting that work on different terrain and everything, we do yeah. a lot of this all terrain uh, training, mm. uh, lots of walking out in hand um, and finding things like this to play on is, is a big part of the of our courses and where people mm. go. So, but leading... I suppose the thing to say about this, Hannah, is it's probably, this is quite advanced because I can see Freckles there, he's got the musculature to be able to cope in that. Yeah, I mean... You just put any old horse at something like that because they might end up hurting themselves because they're so weak in various things, haven't got the stability. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it's really um, about starting where the horse is. And so the great thing is that you can really help a horse, even if they're, you know, older, younger, or if, they're, if you do have limited, like even Khalil the Arab with the deformed foot, like there's limited that he's been able to do, but been able to do enough to, to really kind of help him um, improve his soundness to mm -hmm. levels way beyond the vets expected. Mm -hmm. Um and so yeah it's and if you've got a horse who's out of shape just like with us you have to start really slow and gentle and building up but it's amazing the difference that you can make so um mm. for example since so i moved to france two years nearly two years ago now and it's been a whirlwind <laughs> and so much to do here but and in that time the my horses have had quite some some breaks um mm. And India, my warm blood, who has always struggled metabolically in various ways. Yes, India. Yeah, that's her. Yes. <laughs> so that was, uh, yeah. So she's had problems, as you can kind of see in that picture, with um, mm -hmm. uh, sugar. She's uh, quite crusty. Yeah, yeah. Quite crusty. Um, and I mean, gosh, she was on no grass at all in for Yorkshire mm -hmm. standards. But um, yeah, muscle stiffness is problems in her feet and big mm -hmm. seasons and. Mm -hmm. Oh, just you know, the lot. So anyway, since we moved here, um, she's been way better for that because I now live in the mountains. It's mostly forested. They're on hay the whole time and it, they live on a nice big slope. But the others have all kept their um, kind of strength and fitness up pretty well through just okay. daily life. Um, but she just without this work it just drops the muscle oh, really? which I'd never seen before um in her so it's a really interesting how the, the change of environment has just switched our problems around so in some ways yes. she's loads better but we've got these other issues to deal with and um, so um I've started this um kind of halfway through now a three month I wanted to show people how these exercises really help build top line in a horse mm -hmm. who is not, not have top line and yeah. um at the end of last year, she um, was very, very uh, under muscled, especially yeah. along, along the top line. Um, because again, she'd had a period of time, a chunk of a few months without consistent work. Um, uh -huh. And at the beginning, because she was weak and because she didn't have it, I was just doing 10 minutes at a time. And it's really simple. It's all in hand. It's all in walk. Really simple things, getting her to stretch out, transitions, walk, halt, back up, bending around walking um over poles just really little bits and pieces we do fun stuff mm -hmm. as well obviously pedestal she actually can turn all the way around on that without stepping a foot off which she oh loves. wow <laughs> um for proprioception but yeah just like lifting her legs up to to find the target so she's got to lift mm -hmm. each leg and lift it really high and and find oh. out you know, where the target is and stuff like that um and I actually was surprised how much she improved in the first month because we had so much snow and gales that <laughs> there's quite mm -hmm. a lot of time, despite my best intentions, where again, uh, we just weren't able to do anything. But just doing it that little bit regularly changed her um, habitual posture, which meant yeah. that the way that she was standing and moving in uh, in the field was dif different all mm -hmm. the time, even though she was only getting these kind of short bursts. Mm -hmm. um, and she uh, has already increased her the muscle along her yeah. top line. And now she's getting fitter, we can gradually start to ask mm -hmm. for more and more. Um, I wonder if... Doesn't... Been... Sorry, Hannah, carry on. No, I just say it doesn't have to be much that make, can make a big no. difference to them. I just wonder if she's if she's um, experienced the same sort of thing I did when I managed to um, drop some weight a few years ago. And initially, so much of it was congestion stuck in the system and lymph and all this mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And I think when I dropped that off, I did look a bit like, not skeletal by any means, but I, I and I realised, and I thought I look really, really weak, but I was the same. 
I wasn't any weaker in myself, but I looked terrible. But actually then I was able to build the muscle correctly with the correct, with better chemistry, you know, with better mm -hmm. internal chemistry. So I wonder if that's what's been going on for her, when, you know, particularly with their sort of EMS types and their, it's a lot yeah. to get yeah. rid of that sugar, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think. And um, then her muscle has to rebuild, but it's in a different way. So yeah, it will be very interesting to see how that goes for you. Yeah, she's well, she's, she's, doing, she's doing great. And she's, um, yeah, she's a very, uh, she's much happier. I mean, she was very happy there, but in her body, she's much happier here. Yeah. The, yeah. The life now this is, and who's this one? This is, um, this is not um, her, is it? It's not this, this is Rowan. She oh, um, came from... Is it Rachel? Is this your horse? Kind well, of. <laughs> but she's, she's kind of now really Hannah's, but she came yeah. from Hope Posture's Rescue in Leeds, who mm -hmm. we've, we've worked closely with for years and trained their staff in positive reinforcement and so on. And so we got her in 2014. Um, and she was meant to be um, my little riding pony to take me into my old age because she's about 13, 13, two, something like that. Something like that. And yeah. I'm only five foot folks, so don't get too, too worried. <laughs> um, and, but she again had had um, a very traumatic, uh, we think the, the charity thinks she'd been in a, a driving accident um, and okay. she was absolutely terrified of anything that looked like a stick. She was terrified of ropes and all the rest of it. And we eventually decided, <clears throat> although she is the star of our um, restarting course, and Hannah did take her through um, restarting her to be ridden, and I did ride her a bit, um, really, again, emotionally, we didn't feel that she was going to be safe enough, well, not for, for me not at the you. time. Well, th th there's a bit more to this story. Yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry. I was just trying, <laughs> to, summarize, I was trying to summarize it a bit because of time. But you can't <laughs> <laughs> well we just felt like she was doing really well but there was still like this anxiety edge to yeah, her yeah um and long story short mm. after very a lot of uh, uh vets having a look and dentists having a look and nobody finding anything for a long time eventually she got x-rayed and it turned out that she had a tooth root abscess that she'd had oh, since wow. we got her and that uh had caused a huge amount of just this kind of residual tension and anxiety yeah. that we yeah. couldn't get rid of. So since that, then that she's been much yeah. uh, calmer again, but then we moved to France and, you know. But you did happened. a super retraining uh, job with her and this is a little bit of it. And um, I just wanted to say, because we've not really talked about what positive reinforcement is or, no. or the difference. No. Yeah. But one of the differences is instead of um, encouraging a horse to go forward from behind, um, you know, like with a lunging whip or whatever, mm -hmm. we we train them to follow the target. So you can see the blue target there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means that they're really going forward. They've got a reason to go forward. Um, Hannah's using the target there to ask her to lower her head and to stretch while mm -hmm. she goes over these poles. So one of the big differences is that the in you've talked about the emotions in the brain of the horse in in positive reinforcement it's all the positive stuff that's getting lit up um mm. and particularly what's called the seeking system which is where you're looking for things it's the thing that makes you go out shopping on a saturday and you think today yeah. i'm going to get those that those perfect pair of shoes mm. um and you you know you go around all the sh shoe shops so it's it's a very um it's when your brain is alive and interested and keen yeah. Um, to to go for things so that changes the movement too there's a real difference in the movement of a horse that's yeah. moving forward towards something compared mm. to them, you know having something yes. behind them yeah. tensing, up, tensing backwards yeah there's, and also you can then do things like uh, position their head where you mm. want it to be so you can teach them to have a low head you can teach them to have a higher head if they need it if they're a bit on the forehand um, you, you know, you do a lot of work with the target, which teaches them what you want, and then you transfer it onto rain cues. And mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, it just looks like you're riding a horse, you know, mm -hmm. like anybody else. But how you've taught it is different in the brain, and that creates this this beneficial state in the brain, this happy horse yeah. state. Yeah. And, and when you're working like that, how much are you having to look at the horse and, and think, is a bit too stretched out because it's difficult to take in the whole horse when you're in that sort of position or are you I mean I imagine Hannah you're probably doing it intuitively now 
without even thinking um, you can just sense what's happening behind the behind you that sort of thing yeah I think one of the benefits is that none of this stuff came easily to me so I found it because yeah. uh, I find a lot of when I've been have been learning a lot about how horses move or looking at kind of classical dressage stuff and things like um it, it when I was learning it a lot of it seemed very very complicated and I couldn't really see what they were talking about actually it goes back to when I started equine touch and I remember not being able to feel what we were talking about either <laughs> and I learned that too but um uh so yes one of the things that I <laughs> in which is the way that I go about things is then uh question 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 so then I started yeah. to really uh explore and play and what I really wanted to to find was kind of like simple ways that pe people who've never done this stuff before how they can get started to understand mm -hmm. how their horse is moving what they might need um so I don't especially at the beginning the first thing that I do is to encourage people first of all just to increase the variety of movements that the horse is doing so okay if your horse there are some horses especially like big cob types for example you can picture and they, they tend to kind of go with their nose on the floor and their kind of toes dragging and it can really benefit them to have um to kind of come up a little bit to do some um exercises which start to kind of get them thinking about lifting but then you have other horses who tend to be far more uh extreme where they're really head high they're kind of hollow and we need to get them to stretch down and of course most horses are, are not uh, an extreme they're kind of somewhere in the middle um mm. but just for example getting a horse to play around with well can we do a long stretchy walk now can we walk as slowly as possible and can we bend this way and can we bend that way and can we walk up this gentle slope and walk down this gentle slope can we walk across the gentle slope can we go over one pole um, and yeah. just starting to vary the movements or already helps without feeling mm -hmm. like you have to prescribe what that horse actually needs and it helps to kind of create um you know, we're looking for this kind of whole body. Uh, it's not as I, I'm not training them to, to move in a specific way for a specific discipline or anything like that. I'm looking for like, OK, well, I want a horse who is able to uh, be more gymnastic, who is yeah. stronger, who is more supple generally, who is um, who is straighter, more even, more body aware. And literally just by doing a variety of movements, walking on a variety of surfaces, walking at a, a variety of paces begins that process very, very naturally anyway. And then mm -hmm. you can do exercises like, um, so one of the, the, the beginning, the first ways that I teach getting horses to bend, is that um, we teach them that a hand on the shoulder means to move the shoulders over and we teach them to follow a target and you put those together where you have the target in front so the horse is moving towards the target you put your back hand towards the shoulder and they move the shoulder away and hey presto the horse starts to bend um, and I just get people to do that so they walk straight and then they ask the horse to bend and then they walk straight on the track again and they do that one side and the other and generally they feel that on one side the horse is the shoulders coming on top of them and on the other the horse is drifting away and we're mm. like okay well already we've got a lot of information here that they didn't have before about yeah. how the horse is naturally asymmetrical and literally just by practicing that exercise equally on both sides in a few weeks it'll be much better so um yeah it's going to start off really basic and then yeah you, uh, people can take it um you can get very very particular and very detailed um as you go but at the beginning a lot of it is um just really simple and because it comes back down to is the horse relaxed and willing then mm. you can't really push them because if it becomes uncomfortable you lose the relaxation yes. and willingness you start to see tension yes. creeping in into yeah. the muscles into the face and yeah not yeah. even if they're doing it you, they're not able to do it and be soft with it so yeah. um yeah and I suppose happens. ultimately you're the the work the riders exercising a lot as well I mean I because I long rein not just from behind you know I'll come to the side and everything but I know yeah. you know I've had a bit of a workout sometimes it's I'm not yeah. just standing there having a horse go round and round and round you know because I'm actually moving with him and then you can start trying to do liberty work or something which is a fantastic yeah fantastic when the horse actually wants to be with you i remember i've had times where artists stood at the end of the arena and i've stood at one end and 
He's just ignored me. <laughs> and then you realize yeah. then when you breathe out and you relax, they go, oh, all right, now I'll come to you. Yeah, yeah you sort of very bring much. bring that so. side of things in, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. Yeah. So you're here. You're you're doing and 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 do, do you do mirroring? Because I mean, you see all these things with usually a bloke, you know. But somebody else sort of, um, you know. Oh well, I dance with horses, or I do this, or I do that, and everyone thinks, oh, isn't that marvelous? I wish I could do that. But essentially, you can. It's just yes. It's just trying to find the skills within yourself and practice. I suppose is it? Yes. So don't talk about uh, follow match lead. Well, we, yes, it, we, the mirroring is really important. And again, it's something horses do naturally. So mm -hmm. in a herd of horses, um, they will um, they will mirror, you know, which leg leads and, and that sort of thing. Um, Lucy Reese has done some amazing work um, looking at horses in herds when they're, you know, when they're galloping as, as a herd. And, and they basically are like a, a flock of birds or a shoal of fish, the way that they all turn together and so on. Uh -huh. um, and it's this synchrony and they have the synchrony with the companion they're nearest to. And of yeah. course, foals follow their mother. Um, yeah. And, and you'll, if you watch a, a foal with its mother, the foal, if the mother's, you know, grazing with her right leg, four forward so will the foal be and you know yeah. so the synchrony is really comforting for horses actually it's what they do naturally it's what they do with their closest companions and um, so we can really help build connection with horses by the simple action of as you walk with a horse when you're leading a horse or the horses in the field if you just match your legs to their front legs um so you can and you start practicing that what the horse will do very very naturally is they will then they will then start to match you and we call it follow match lead so you start off by following the horse so maybe you're leading the horse in from the field and you just pay attention to which legs are going first and match like you're doing a dance with somebody yeah. and then there comes this point when you find that the horse is 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 also matching you and the two of you are matching and it feels really comfortable yeah um and not matching starts to feel uncomfortable which is yeah. great and mm -hmm. at that point, when it starts to feel really comfortable you can then be very conscious and think okay when well, i'll stand beside my horse um i'll I'll have my weight evenly in both front feet and the horse is standing there with the weight evenly. Right. We're going to lead off with the left four. So you just put your weight onto your right leg, slowly lift your left leg and start to take that step. And hey, presto, your horse has led off with the left four. Um, wow. And it's just a great way of building connection very easily with a horse. It's fun to try. It's fun to do. Um, but then, of course, you can then lead the horse into movement. So, Hannah talked about um, teaching a horse to move over with a hand on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. Well, we start off teaching that um, by using a target and we put the target under the neck. So the horse's head goes round and that's the yeah. horse beginning to move the shoulder away and you um, mark and reward that. But then you can be really paying attention and you can, you can think, right, which do I want the, the, the left four, say, to cross over the right four or do I want the right four to step out and then the left four to follow it? And by building this synchrony, you can choose that. You can say, well, I'm going to move my left leg across with the as I put the target across. And that's how your horse will move. Or you can say, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to move my inside leg out towards the horse mm -hmm. with that target. And then you'll find the horse will do that. So we build in. It's a lot of fun. I mean, it just it just gets addictive. It's great. Um, yeah. But that's that's basically how you dance with a horse. And it, you're just yeah. starting off, at, you know, it, it, you're starting off in the Strictly tra Training Room week one. <laughs> I think it's... Um... <laughs> and you follow my feet, you know, and then... Yeah, you know, yeah. In, well, in it is months. fantastic. And I know when I'm, when I'm working with Artie, you know, I'll sort of like, you know, do the old slow down or I'll stop and he'll stop. And I'm very yeah. happy with that. It's when you yeah. see the the horse on the on the lunge that's just going metronome and it's yeah. not engaged it's not thinking no. it's just no. going round and round and round and the and the riders you know and you just feel that they should yeah. be trying something a little bit different make it a bit yeah. more interesting i don't know but it's difficult to get out of that loop isn't it if you've not seen anything like that or you yeah yeah and to know where to get started i think and yeah. i think sometimes when we look at uh somebody who's very skilled whether it's like a really really good rider who appears to do everything invisibly or it's somebody doing some amazing liberty work like if you're if you've no, don't know the steps it can 
you do that how would you even know how to get started but really is this combination of um internal and external cues so the internal cues are the ones that your horses respond to naturally which you've already talked about so your mm. breath the, how you move the way your focus is um and then the external cues are the ones that you have to teach so things like touching a target moving over when you put your uh, hand on them teaching a voice cue walk on halt and um, to ask them to move their quarters over things like this they you have to go through a process to teach them and so that they understand and all of our interactions with horses are really a combination of the two together mm. so um it gives you a lot of um I, I think as you kind of understand how to break things down and, and teach yes. them um, and then you get get to teach them systematically and then you get into being aware of your body and going, okay, well, okay, so my, for example, really simple. My horse knows that when I hold the target out, it walks forward, it touches the target with its nose, it gets a reward. But then you can look at like, okay, well, how do I stand when I do it? If I hold the target out quickly, yeah compared to holding it out slowly if I hold it out higher if I hold it out lower and then the horse actually responds quite differently and some horses especially if they've got any kind of um trauma or if they're kind of very sensitive I mean they're all sensitive you know more, more reactive types you can get a huge difference in responses just in very um uh small changes in how you actually ask them to do things even just leading your horse yeah. in from the field if mm. you've got a horse who tends to be a bit excited for example practice just some deep breathing softening mm. your shoulders as you're leading them and they'll mm. already kind of relax and and yeah. calm down so yeah, yeah. It's, it's and I suppose I suppose it's it's um it's reminding them of something that's where I would come from with my energetic head and also from the traumatic experiences I've had usually the most traumatic have been in carriages but you know those sort of things where something triggers the memory and it might be a sound or it might be you know the wind going a certain way or or it could be as you say the head going into a certain position and they suddenly get that tightening that reminds them because that emotion's held in that tissue there and everything so mm -hmm. I suppose it's however you want to think about it or maybe don't even want to think about it but it's just trying to help the horse and yourself to just unravel things I suppose really you know and, yeah, and, and the benefits good. come in at the end of the day or you know or, or or in that joy of as you say that connection where you feel that the have horse a nice time you. together yes isn't really. that what we're all after just having a really lovely this time this is our very very expensive hobby. We want to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well we do so much so much of the other external work as you say you know picking up poo and everything it'd be nice to yeah. actually have a bit that we enjoy but I've seen people come into I mean, I, and I've been, you know, I'm just as bad sometimes, but you come in and you think, I've got to do this, 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 this. And you don't actually at that moment connect with your horse at all. You're not really present. And then you just shove a feed at them and you think, oh, I've got to get home and get tea. And you can see them going, you know, I did that with Archie today and he's standing there going. And I thought, why is he standing there? Does he want to come in there? OK. And I got he wanted to spend a bit of time with me. But I was going yeah. to come and spend time with you guys. So, so I thought, yeah. oh, <laughs> tomorrow you'll have to wait. <laughs> we had the same with our horses today we, we went skiing and then we had to rush back for this so, yes yes <laughs> they got short shrift today i'm afraid they got a bit of food they yeah. should be fine but sometimes it's not all about the food so when you're talking about the positive reinforcement and they get the reward i suppose a lot of people would worry about are they going to get nippy they're going to get bitey you know that sort of thing when do you reward and it's that's building a skill isn't it breaking things up into those small yeah. bite-sized pieces and then you don't reward every little bit do you you sort of combine it more and things it's actually Name i would say the hardest, story. <laughs> the, the hardest part about uh, clicker training is getting started well because it's easy it's a, it's a very simple concept but like uh, riding or training a horse anyway actually being able to do it well is a quite a difficult skill that takes a while to learn um so um yeah i our approach is really um comes from looking at the emotional piece so okay. you can um train with food rewards and get a behavior but still have a horse that is not relaxed mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can get a lot of over excitement a lot of frustration you can build confusion yeah. in um yeah. and i i think 
and we have done all that. We've done all that. We are not, yes. you know, we're not. <laughs> we weren't born perfect, and so no. we, we've taken this to. I have been, I have been bitten on the knees by my Shetland pony because of <laughs> a long that time ago. a long time ago because of the way I trained with rewards. It, I think you know, um, so we we've made those mistakes. But people, yeah. So I and, and I think that that in traditionally you know a lot of people are told don't feed horses because it creates these problems i think sometimes people are a little forget that a lot of the problems in traditional horse world are that horses have to have to be led in bits that they don't want to go to the arena that we have to carry a whip to make them go forwards like these are other types of problems so mm-hmm. um which also come from training that's maybe not so great in, in another way either so yeah it's just like um but there are ways to avoid all of that and for it to be softer and calmer and this is really how we got into the emotional piece isn't mm-hmm, it mm-hmm. of um it's it is technically quite easy to train stuff using a marker and rewards and i think when we both started we found it incredibly empowering how easy it was to teach horses things compared to all the other ways that we'd done it um but yeah in terms of the emotional piece um that's really what got us really looking at okay our priority and this is why we called our business connection training our priority as a horse who's relaxed calm willing engaged with us now uh having a horse who is both relaxed and motivated is amazing um but it's not always straightforward to get to so how you start is really really important um or if you've already started and you've got those problems there are lots of ways to change it as well but um yeah how we start and how we teach people to start is very very um low key and relaxed and actually it begins a lot with finding a place to connect that's not about training and yeah. then building up not about there. feeding and so on so you know yeah. i mean a simple one that many many people do anyway is that if they're grooming their horse and they'll give the horse a hay net to to chew at yeah. Um, you're actually doing positive reinforcement at that point because the horse's brain is enjoying the food and everything and providing you're not doing aversive grooming that they're hating, providing they're mm. at least neutral about the grooming, preferably positive about the grooming, they're actually enjoying that in their body. You're mm. doing positive reinforcement using food, but okay. you are doing it in a way that keeps the animal relaxed and happy and not nipping. And mm. so it kind of comes from that principle because we can feed, we, we, we can reward with hay. We often reward with hay, um, just the normal hay they get. We'll reward with hay in buckets. Um, maybe we'll add a little bit of feed, nice, you know, extra nice feed in the bucket, um, but it's not coming from your hand. You know, there's a whole lot of work we do with people that builds up to the point when you are actually feeding really good goodies, you know, carrots out of your hand is um we would see that as as a sort of later development and and i think in the early days you know everybody went out there with with a clicker which is a very very strong marker and horses if it's paired with something like carrots horses get very excited about the sound um but your marker can just be the word good and you can pair that with hay you know so you say good and you give the horse a you know some hay to eat they're their emotions are going to be much, much lower. So it's yeah. just all about choosing how you do it. Uh, and if you can start off, um, I mean, it depends on the horse, obviously, but if you can start off very low key reward, very low key way that you deliver it and just build that up slowly, um, mm-hmm. then they become very easy. And all our horses are very, very easy to be around. They don't expect food. They know the rules around it. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, they're dead easy. And, you know, um, after a while, they do love what you're doing. They love the game. They love the attention. Horses are highly empathic animals. That's how they operate as a herd, which means they feel the feelings around them. You mentioned mm. it energetically. Um, mm. But we've, we've it's been proven scientifically that they're, they will match their heart rate to the person that's with them. They match Mm. the heart rates to each other. But then if we're there with them, they match their heart rates to us. So if we're Mm. anxious and and have a quick heartbeat, so will our horse. So that's why the deep breath and all the rest of it is really important. And the grounding, Mm. because it just Mm. slows your heartbeat, which slows their heartbeat. So they they have a brain that wants to connect. That's what they have to do for survival. And for Mm. some amazing reason they transfer that to us as well as you've said Archie wanted you to stay and have a chat he didn't want you just to 
food up and leave. And, um, you know, Heather the other day left her food and stood by the gate looking at me longingly to say, can we go into the arena? And she'd, she'd look at me and look at the arena, look at me and look at the arena. And she <laughs> anything that she wanted. Um, but I wasn't playing that day. I had to apologise. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I so you love the here from... Sorry, Rachel, we just had a comment here from Nikki who says that her horse gets very excited when he's done something right and he gets verbal praise as well as some treats, but actually the voice seems to be good enough, yes. you know? And I think yeah. sometimes that also releases tension in ourselves, doesn't it? Because when I, as a driver, yeah. I use voice a lot. And I remember yes. doing a dressage test, a ridden one, and I just kept talking all the way through it. And they sort of said, yeah. oh, you know, mark me down. I just thought, well, the point was the horse knows the word, you know, cues. And yes. it's like the I word. Don't Why would I don't understand that. I don't you understand know? it. Why is it cheating if you yes. use a voice aid rather than a leg aid? You I don't know. Myth, but not a voice. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's all the matter. Yeah. But it gets back vocal as well. Do you find your horses mm. get vocal? Do they talk to you yes. a lot sort of things, you know? As in yes. Some of them. Yes. It depends on the horse. It really mm. depends on the But they're much the more horse. vocal than they were than the, in the olden days um, before we started using positive reinforcement, I would say. Yeah, maybe. But I just want to go back to that when we were talking about, like, keeping it calm all the time. But the, the, No, no, not all the time. The, <laughs> the, the question is then, like, well, why would you use why would you uh, use food if we've got all this great connection anyway? And I think that um, it's a lot of the things that we're asking horses to do are not uh, innately rewarding enough. And that can be anything from standing for a long time for the farrier to going into a horse box to being treated by the vet to also being, you know... Taken away from your companions. Yeah, to go being ridden and things. And, <laughs> and, it, and it's a really... Um, although we we want to ground it in this connection I also want the horses who are able to, to do things and want to do things and want to come out and who are resilient and able to deal with like healthcare things that they need but also love and want to go out riding and want to train and want to do stuff in, with me in the arena and things um, and I've just found it's an incredibly powerful way to bring more uh, motivation um, willingness and joy mm -hmm. as well as parity into the the extra things that we do together so we kind of base it all in this emotional piece but then um it's looking at like okay but the horses are in our human world so how can we best um you know enrich their lives and also enrich our lives <laughs> together yeah. in a way that works for both of us well well said hannah i think that's a great postscript <laughs> i don't know if you want to leave it there i'm sure we're going to get a lot of a lot of feedback from this one and, and uh, maybe we can go into a little bit more specifics or people can follow you at Connection Training either on Facebook or on your website. And uh, and I think I, you know, I keep meaning to touch on it, but it, it just applies. You've got to put a bit of attention on it, haven't you, really? And that's the thing. Yes. Just say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put yeah, a bit of attention yeah. there. And, and I just want to yes, finish yes. with this lovely picture here where you've got the mm -hmm. new guys riding on the beach. And this must be a joy for you, Rachel, isn't it, to have a Highland pony and you can get your legs that wide? <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it reminds me of giving birth, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Heather, Hannah got me Heather for my 60th birthday, so an incredible wow. present to get. Um, and this was us. Uh, this was me fulfilling the dream of my life, which was to mm. canter on the beach. So all I'd ever wanted to do as a child, I grew up by the beach, but I never had a horse. And so eventually that's my one of my lifetime dreams being fulfilled there. And, yeah. and Freckles following the spotty body is always a good thing for a horse. He's, he's, he's a real uh, hub horse in the herd and, and all the mares love him and trust him. And so, um, so he's a great lead horse to have in that situation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic photo. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for joining me. That's been brilliant. It's been absolutely super. And lots of fun, Chris, and lovely to spend some time with you. Yeah. <laughs> don't get to see you often yeah. enough. <laughs> no, well, no, absolutely. And we'll, uh, I hope we'll maybe we can do a follow up at some point. That would be lovely. We've had some great people. I um, haven't managed to give a name check to any of you. Dominica, Linda, Karen, Helen, Nikki. Um, and I'm sure we had Amanda here earlier on and everything as well. So it's been absolutely well, thanks for coming, everybody. It's a joy because yeah, you're so me. full of light. All your smiley faces is just lovely. Uh, and, <laughs> I, and I think, um, yeah, you've done a wonderful thing for, for the horses and you're bringing such a beautiful thing for so many people and horses. So well done, you guys. Oh, thank you. And I thank suppose that was driven too. by Toby and everything, you know, driven by 
the need the it, need yeah. is there that's the thing and you're meeting that need, the need so there, yeah. but what a, what a wonderful journey he's taken us on and all the things yeah. we've learned and the people we've met and the stuff not what you're expecting eh? <laughs> no no <laughs> Definitely tough in the time in the moment, but grateful now we've come out the other side. Looking back, yes, they gave you that. Get a very yes. big birthday cake for for us having him for twenty five years and a couple of weeks time. <laughs> oh well, that's going to be brilliant. Oh well, hopefully we'll get to see some photos from that. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks very much, Rachel and Hannah. Nice, Lovely. Chris, nice to see Thanks, you. Bye, for now. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.